uh, to tell you about some of our programs that are coming up. Of course, we're very excited that you're here for Todd's program. Todd is one of our favorites. You've really made it, you know, when we put you out on the marquee by the by the road, by McMurray Road. We had, you know, Todd DePastino is back in the house. So we had that up there, and oh my, horns were honking and everything. So we are so glad to have Todd back in town. I think you're overselling this. <laughs> well, behind Todd on that, on the wall there, I do want to, a, um, direct your attention to the eight individuals that we have featured in our bunker. So on the way out, uh, Jim McNutt, I know he's here in the room. Oh, yeah. There he is, way in the back. Jim McNutt is here who filmed along with Diane Leone. She's a member of our library, Peters Township Library Foundation. They interviewed uh, local veterans. Uh, Patty Fink is also here tonight as one of our civilians. Who else? George is here. Is anyone else here that was featured in the bunker? Richard? Richard oh, and Jim. All right, terrific. So we have uh, one, two, three, four, five of our eight uh, featured here. So please uh, hear their, listen to their story, talk to them afterwards. We also have refreshments here from the foundation as well. But I'm going to have more. I'll tell you more about that. I just have two other programs I want to draw your attention to. One that is coming up very soon, right after Labor Day, the Tuesday, day after Labor Day, is called Question persuade and refer. This is known as QPR, which is actually CPR, that you would want to try to remember if you are ever in the company of someone who might be contemplating suicide. We actually have the director of this program from our state coming to our library. It's going to be the first library in the state to do this program, part of our Pennsylvania PA Forward initiative to bring about health literacy programs to our community. It is a very important procedure. It's very easy, just like CPR. Once you learn it, you know it. And question, persuade, and refer are the three letters, Q, P, and R, that he'll teach you. So we're inviting our police department, we're inviting counselors, teachers, parents, students. Um, and you are also certainly welcome to attend. It's a very important initiative. So that's Tuesday, the day after Labor Day from at 6.30. And then just one more. Quick one I want to tell you about is going to be Sunday, September 23rd. Margaret Deitzer, uh, head of our reference department, is working very closely with Juliana, Julie Hera De Stefano. She is um, a film producer. She's from CMU and created a film called Journey to Normal. And it is a look at female veterans and what it's like to transition back after deployment back into uh, society here in the U.S. And she's, written, she's created this film. She'll be here that day. We're going to show the film and then have a discussion about it afterwards. So if you know any female vets that are post 9-11, we have this lovely display here. Everything from marriage during deployment and when Janie comes marching home, which are some new books about women who serve in the military. We'd certainly love for you to pick up. We've given some of them on, our, on your chairs. We have them here at the refreshment table, so take them and pass them along. So now, I want to just quickly introduce Maura Kelly. She is the president of the Peters Township Library Foundation. And you probably, I know, familiar faces, so you know we've been building all year to a very special event on November the 7th with an author that Maura's going to tell you about. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Maura Kelly. I'm president of the Peters Township Library Foundation. The commercials are almost over. <laughs> um, we did want to, uh, once again, for those of you who have been here at prior programs, we've been telling you about this for a while, but I think as of today, we're only 76 days away, which actually is very close, and we have a lot of work to do. So Tim O'Brien is going to be here. It's a huge honor that he will be visiting Peters Township. He's been nominated for a few Pulitzers. He won the Dayton Literary Peace Prize for Literature. I mean, I could go on and on with his resume. It's pretty amazing that he's coming. He is part of the required reading at a lot of universities and high schools, his book, The Things They Carried. And here in Peters Township, it is required reading for our junior honors level students. Um, if you have not already read it, it's a very powerful book. I encourage you to read it. Um, he has also, um, he is 
a, was a consultant for the Ken Burns, Lynn Novick PBS documentary, 18 hours long. He's more heavily um, represented in the first and last um, DVDs. And um, this coming fall, for those of you who watch This Is Us on television, um, he was hired as a consultant to the writers on that show. Jack Pearson, the backstory for the father, the fictional father in that story, was that he was a Vietnam vet. And um, when they were trying to do justice to that storyline, they knew that they wanted to consult with Tim O'Brien to get it right. So um, he will be here November 7th. Our venue is Peters Township High School. Tickets are on sale either on our library website or you can get them here at the circulation desk. Uh, $20 for regular folks, $15 for veterans, $5 for students. And if you're a huge Tim O'Brien fan and want to spend a little more time with him, we do have VIP tickets available for $60. Along with that comes some fantastic food from a local chef, Garnett Livingston. Um, we'll have music at the VIP reception. You'll also get to choose a book of Tim O'Brien's of your choice as part of your ticket price. And then, of course, have reserved seating for the event itself. So we encourage you to buy tickets now. The library holds 864 people. We're not sold out yet, but it wouldn't surprise me if we do once people get wind of it because he is like a really big deal. So thank you. Well, I'll just step in. My name is Todd. Uh, I'm the director of the Veterans Breakfast Club, and I'm here to talk about this remarkable trip that we took in March to Vietnam, a two-week historical tour, 17 of us, and I'm delighted to come here and talk about it uh, because it was so fascinating and so much fun every step of the way. It was like somebody sprinkled us with fairy dust when we landed in Hanoi and it didn't rub off until we left Saigon. And I came home from this trip and my wife said, how was it? And I said, it was the highlight of my life. Yes. I learned in that moment that it is not something you say to your wife. So I've been kind of making up for it ever since. And one of the things that made this trip so special is that we traveled, 17 of us traveled together, and seven of us were Vietnam veterans. And uh, here's a picture of them at the DMZ. And actually, four of these veterans are here tonight, and I'm going to embarrass them by pointing them out and asking them to stand. And I'll start with Rick Arisman, who served in the Navy. And we have Larry Woods, who served with the Air Force Security Forces. And we have Ben Wright, who was an Air Force pilot in Vietnam. And then we have Ray Emilio, who was a Navy Corpsman Marine at Khe Sanh uh, in Vietnam. And I'm going to ask you to thank you, Stan. Stan. And now I would like to ask, I know we have other Vietnam veterans here tonight, could you please stand? And again, anybody who's a veteran, that keeps standing. Anybody else who's a veteran who served in the military at some point? Wonderful. Thank you guys for coming out. I appreciate it. We, uh, our trip, we traveled the, the length of Vietnam. We arrived in Hanoi and worked our way down to Saigon, then south of Saigon to the Mekong Delta. Vietnam is an unusual country in terms of geography. It's long and thin. It's about 1,000 miles long, and at its narrowest, only 30 miles wide. It's hemmed in along the west in some of the most forbidding remote mountains on Earth, the Anam Mountains, which stretch from the Chinese border all the way down almost to Saigon. And in the east, of course, it's hemmed in by the South China Sea and the Gulf of Tonkin. And so the country changes as you move south. One of the most wonderful things about the trip was the diversity of the people who came with us. We had these old guys, like Larry, uh, who came with us. And then we also had my daughter. My 17-year-old daughter came along. And I asked her if she'd like to go, not thinking that she would want to go at all. And she leapt at the chance. And I said, um, she leapt at, the, at the, you know, the, the offer. And I asked her why she was interested in going. And she said, like, it's a once in a lifetime. I'm traveling to Vietnam with Vietnam vets. Are you kidding me? Like, I've got to go. 
And she discovered while we were on the ground in Vietnam that there's no drinking age in Vietnam. <laughs> and she befriended some of the, our older vets, including Lou Nudie, who's back there, 75 years old. And this is uh, her drinking a cocktail our final night in Saigon. And I thought I would play, we had a very talented young man, uh, Evan Mulgrave, who, who traveled with us, who took a lot of video, and he created a two-minute kind of highlight reel that I thought I would play that captures kind of the sense of the trip. This trip was taken uh, under the direction of the Veterans Breakfast Club, which gathers veterans together to share their stories. You all have uh, newsletters with you of our upcoming events. And uh, we decided that we should do travel again. We had done travel years ago when we first started, and we laid off of it just because it was, we started doing more local programming here. And, but we realized um, last year that 2018 would be the 50th anniversary of one of the most important events in American history, certainly the seminal event, one of the seminal events of 20th century American history, and that is the Tet Offensive. Uh, many of you remember the Tet Offensive. Many of you were there. Uh, for those of you who are a little fuzzy about what it is, the Tet Offensive was a surprise attack by our enemy, the North Vietnamese Army and the Viet Cong, a surprise attack throughout South Vietnam and it was a surprise because it came during Tet, which is the Lunar New Year. And it was kind of an informal truce that there would be no fighting uh, during Tet. Well, this is the biggest holiday in, in Vietnam. Well, families were going back to their home villages and, and families were getting together and, and celebrating the holiday that there wouldn't be um, any fighting done. There was fighting. It, it was a massive attack, a massive uprising. Uh, a Viet Cong who had filtered into over 100 towns and cities throughout the South and rose up beginning the night of uh, January 30th, 1968. It was quite a stunner in the following days and weeks for folks back home who watched the news and saw these remarkable images of the Viet Cong penetrating the outer wall of the Saigon, of the U.S. Embassy in Saigon. And it was first reported that they had penetrated the embassy itself, which they hadn't done. Uh, images of the North Vietnamese Army taking the ancient citadel at Hue, and many other towns and cities throughout the country. It was a shock, it was a stunner, and most Americans were actually glued to the news in those weeks in late January, early February 1968. By any military measure, the Tet Offensive 
was a massive defeat for the enemy. It should have gone down as one of the greatest military catastrophes uh, really in military history. Uh, the Viet Cong and the NBA, wherever they rose up, we were caught by surprise, but we regrouped and beat them back, and beat them back badly. And in the following weeks, took back every inch of ground that the enemy had taken during the surprise uprising. Um, the death toll among the Viet Cong especially was astronomical. It's estimated, nobody knows exactly how many of the enemy were killed during the initial Tet attacks, and then there were subsequent Tet attacks that we called mini-Tets that came about in May and August. Finally, what we call the Tet Offensive is over in September. If you take the death toll of the enemy from January to September 1968, the best estimate is that 58,000 Viet Cong were killed during the Tet Offensive which is as many Americans as were killed in 15 years of the Vietnam War. So the Tet Offensive was a massive military defeat for the enemy, but, and my students always had a tough time with this, but it ended up being a strategic victory for the enemy because the psychological and political toll that it took on American public opinion at home was so great that it eroded support for the war almost overnight. And the reason for that, I think the reason for the, the quick erosion of support was because, ironically, of a publicity campaign that had been launched by the White House in April of 1967. It was in early 1967 of Lyndon Johnson, President Lyndon Johnson and his advisors noticed that American support for the war was eroding slowly and that there had once been a lot of belief in that we were making progress in the war, but Americans were increasingly seeing that we weren't making progress and that this was probably going to be a long drawn out stalemate. And so the White House wanted to bolster public opinion, wanted to you know, reinvigorate support for the war, and so a national security advisor named Walt Rostow formed a group called the Vietnam Information Group, and they met every week. And their mission was to decide on what story what news story they wanted to feed the media to promote the war. And they did one a week. And it was stunning the effect it had. By July, by August, support for the war was going up again. And the Vietnam Information Group, kind of the, the publicity campaign, culminated in November of 1967 when they called for Major General William Westmoreland to return from Vietnam, William Westmoreland was the, Ameri the commander of uh, all American forces in, in, Viet in Vietnam, uh, called him back from Vietnam to the United States to do a series of publicity speeches, you know, in support of the war. And he gave uh, speeches that were pretty much the, the you know, same every time he gave it. Uh, essentially, he said that the gist of what he said is there's light at the end of the tunnel, that uh, the, war, the end of the war is closer than it looks, and we're going to win. And the enemy is so badly eroded, so badly attrited, so badly hurt, that they really can't even field an effective fighting force any longer. And he said in November at the National Press Club, with 1968, a new phase is starting. We have reached an important point when the end begins to come into view. I have never been more encouraged. And it worked. By Christmas, polls were showing that American belief in the progress of the American war effort, public opinion had risen above 50%. More than 50% of Americans believed that we were making progress, and there was light at the end of the tunnel. And then came Tet. Tet was shattering in its disillusionment, not only with the American war effort in Vietnam, but I also think in our faith in government. And I was very much agreed with the a piece that was written for the 50th anniversary of Tet in the Washington Post by a historian named Josh Zeitz. And he wrote this piece called How Americans Lost Faith in Government. And he traces you know, our current malaise or our current you know, distrust of government to the Tet Offensive. And I think he's on to something. Uh, I think we lost our faith in government and our own government was shattered in Tet. And I don't think we've, we've ever quite put those pieces back together again. 
And at the risk of belaboring the point, I just want to show you one polling question that I find so striking. This is a question that Gallup has been asking since the 1950s. And the question is, do you trust the government in Washington to do what is right just about always or most of the time? And if you look at these early returns, 77% of the American people said, yeah, they trust that the government will do what is right most of the time or always. December 1964, again, 77%. This is the high water mark of American faith in its government. Uh, Tet shattered that faith, and we've never rebounded completely since. Uh, you can see in 1970, it went all the way back up to 54%. That was about the highest it would go. Uh, you'll notice December 2017, the lowest ever recorded. 18% of the American people believe that their government will do what is right just about always or most of the time. Um, I think uh, uh, many of us uh, on the trip relived with every step we took a revelation that American military planners and that I think GIs on the ground in Vietnam, a revelation that came to them after Tet. I think, I think Larry would say this, uh, who was in Vietnam for Tet. Um, that uh, there was a profound realization that we misunderstood the enemy and that we underestimated the enemy. And I think that many of us who went on this trip as we were traveling would nod our heads as we were thinking, wow, we, didn't, we really didn't understand this country when we went to war here. And I know I thought a lot about a story that was told by this guy, David Lamb, who's a journalist in Vietnam. Uh, he covered, he was a correspondent for UPI in, in 1968 to 70, and then again for the fall of Saigon. Here he is, pictured taking notes, talking to General Melvin Zayas. And uh, David was, uh, David had died a couple years ago. He was a friend of mine, a really interesting guy, a great guy. And David would go back to Vietnam in the early 2000s to open up the LA Times Bureau there again. And uh, his wife, his widow, Sandy, traveled with us uh, on our trip. And David told a story. He told it to me, and he also told it in a wonderful book that he wrote called Vietnam Now, which is about how Vietnam has changed since the war. And he told a story about how, you know, there, there, was, there was a brotherhood in Saigon among the journalists, and there were a lot of local Vietnamese who were journalists as well, who cooperated with American journalists. And one of his best friends in Vietnam, it turns out this guy was best friends with a lot of Americans, his name is Phan Duan An, was he, he was a figure in a, 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 a figure in reporting in Saigon. Everybody knew him, and he knew everybody. He had been in the business for a long time. He had worked for the New York Herald Tribune, the, the uh, Christian Science Monitor. He worked for Reuters. And during the Vietnam War, he was the major war correspondent for Time Magazine. I don't think there was a single story that ran in Time Magazine that didn't go across Pham's desk first. And I think you could probably guess what I'm about to say now. Nobody at the time, no um, David Lamb, no American journalist at the time, nobody in the military at the time had an inkling that Pham was in fact a spy. <laughs> that he was in the North Vietnamese Army and he was a jet with the rank of general and that he was there in the South to help the Viet Cong. Turns out he was getting access, unparalleled access, to American intelligence and military information. He was systematically photographing documents, and he would take these little canisters of film, uh, stick them in a banana leaf or in a dead fish, walk to a nearby park, hand it off to a woman, it was usually a woman, who would then take the package and disappear in the Coochie Tunnels. We visited the Coochie Tunnels. These are some of the pictures we took when we were there. Uh, the Coochie Tunnels is a, a remarkable complex of about 250 miles underground tunnel complex that stretched really from the outer western suburbs of Saigon all the way to the Cambodian border. We knew that there were tunnels there. We never knew how elaborate they were. And I think one of the a sobering uh, trip that we took, a side trip that we took on our trip, was visiting the Coochie Tunnels. These Fam would hand off the documents, the documents would disappear into the Coochie tunnels, 
then up near the Cambodian border, then up the Ho Chi Minh Trail, and back to Hanoi. Uh, it was quite, we, Pham was so good that we never realized that he was a spy until the mid-1980s. <laughs> so when David, David and Sandy returned to Vietnam in the 2000s, David looked up a lot of the people he had known during the war, and one of the people he looked up was Pham. And, you know, he, he would say, he, he loved Pham, he loved this guy, he was such a sweet guy. And he said, I knocked on the door and he kind of said, like, what's the deal, man? <laughs> you know, he lied to me the whole time. And he said, to him, you know, Pham had this amazing, very Vietnamese attitude, which is nothing personal, buddy. I, I love you. I loved, you know, I, I wasn't faking it. I loved uh, you Americans, but I was just fighting for my country. I was working for my country. And this is what he told David. And I think this is, this kind of stuck with me as I traveled. He said, the Americans I dealt with were beautiful people. They were very smart. But being smart and making the right decision are two different things. <laughs> the big mistake the Americans made was not understanding Vietnamese history, culture, mentality. They were so sure military strength would win the war, they never bothered to learn who, whom they were fighting. It may be, I think it's true that some of the veterans who traveled with us, I think as we traveled, what was going on in their heads, and certainly what was going on in mine, was trying to figure out who did we fight? Who were these people? You know, what is Vietnamese culture and civilization? And it came, as somebody who taught a history of Vietnam and the Vietnam War for many years at Penn State Beaver, I'm a little embarrassed uh, how little I actually knew. <laughs> you know, what a, what, a, what a puzzle this country really is. And I think the first sense that you get when you arrive in Vietnam of the difference, differentness of the culture is the antiquity of the culture, the ancientness of the culture. The Vietnamese people don't measure time in decades or centuries like we do. They measure time in millennia. And the first stirrings of what would become known as the Vietnamese people uh, are, are detectable 5,000 years ago, 6,000 years ago, even 7,000 years ago in the Red River Valley up at around Hanoi. Uh, these people developed their own language, their own culture, their own what would become a civilization that flourished in the years before Christ. And then at about 1,000 BC, in came the Han Chinese invaders. They invaded this little tiny civilization around Hanoi in the Red River uh, Valley and the Chinese took over and they stayed for a thousand years. A thousand years occupying Vietnam. And they gave the Vietnamese people everything. They gave them a written language, rice cultivation, engineering for irrigation. They gave them a system of bureaucratic administration of government. Uh, they gave them all kinds of, you know, tangible things and intangible things. And it took about 150 to 200 years for the Vietnamese people to take these gifts and turn them against their occupiers and begin a resistance movement that lasted truly at least 800 years against the Vietnamese occupiers, the, Viet uh, uh, the Chinese occupiers. The Vietnamese people always saw themselves as separate from the Chinese and they fought for independence. And it took them 800 years, but they won it in a magnificent battle that actually should be better known. Maybe if there's time, we'll talk about it. the Battle of Bac Dong River in 938, a remarkable battle where they finally evicted their Chinese occupiers. And so the year 938 AD, an independent Vietnam is created. Um, this gives you a sense of what the Han Dynasty was in the, in the year 100, uh, 100 BCE. You have... Uh, very much what is the outline of China today, and then this little piece down here that's just the northern tip of Vietnam. That's where the cradle of Vietnamese civilization started, and that's what was occupied by the Chinese. In fact, the Chinese even gave Vietnam its name. Nam means south. Viet means beyond. This, these were the people beyond the south of the Chinese Empire. And uh, once the Vietnamese people achieved their independence, 
They created their own glorious empire that they called the Dai Viet, or the Great Viet. And hey, you spend 800 years honing your military skills, you might as well use it on other peoples. And they did. They started their march to the south. They still call it the march to the south, where they conquered other civilizations and other cultures on the way, all the way down until the tip of the Mekong River Delta, way down in the south. And it took them 600 years, 700 years. But by 1700, what we know of as Vietnam today was essentially in place. And the Vietnamese people have always, however, viewed the North as the real Vietnam. That's the ancient cradle of Vietnamese civilization. The South, eh, it's like the Wild West here. They're like a much more cosmopolitan, much more ethnically diverse, not totally trusted and integrated. The North is really the heart and soul of Vietnamese civilization. And that's, I think, how many Vietnamese people feel about it. And that's where we entered our trip in Vietnam. We started our trip at Hanoi, right at the heart of ancient Vietnamese civilization. And you feel it. You really feel it. It's uh, these people, this is Vietnam, and it's most Vietnamese. Up in the north, people are patriotic, deeply traditional, conservative, patriarchal. Uh, you could you just get the sense of how different it is. Um, our tour guide, who I'll talk about in a little bit, said, you know, in the North, people really identify with the government, the communist government. Uh, they feel it's, it represents them. If they get cited by the police for something in the North, they don't hesitate to fight it in court. In the South, in Saigon, if you get cited by the police, you keep your mouth shut. You don't fight it because you're afraid of the police because that communist government is kind of seen like a foreign occupying force. But in the North, it's very much their government. And it's a, it was an, uns I think our first unsettling feeling came right when we arrived in uh, Noi Bai Airport, International Airport in Hanoi. And it's as we were standing in line to get our passports checked and our visas checked, uh, even I was a little taken aback by this. You, could, you look up, you know, the people behind the counter, you know, with these little glass uh, you know, carols where they're, you step up to the table, you show your passport. The guys sitting on the other side were all wearing the same North Vietnamese Army uniform that they wore during the Vietnam War. And one of our travelers, Andy Niggett, a Marine who, who served in I-Corps, said, I don't like the look of these guys. <laughs> and it's remarkable. I mean, it's been 50 years. You can tweak the uniform a little bit, you know? It's stunning how absolutely here they are today, and here's what they looked like then. Exactly the same. It was a little unnerving. It was at the airport we met this guy who we all absolutely fell in love with, 35-year-old Khan. Khan was our guide until he said goodbye to us in Saigon. Khan was absolutely remarkable. I, I've had students like Khan before in class, so hungry for knowledge, very smart. He knew his stuff, always asking us questions, always wanting to learn more. He knew a lot, of course, about Vietnamese culture, and he would teach us along the way. Uh, but he would ask us a lot of questions, too, about American culture. And he would also, I found this totally fascinating, ask us about what we knew about the Vietnam War. Because it turns out when you're raised in an authoritarian communist country, you're not getting the real truth. You're not getting the real history, and he knew it. And he wanted to know what did we know that he didn't. So we had this wonderful dialogue going back and forth the whole trip. And he taught me, and I know all of us, many things. But one thing, I was so ashamed when he pointed it out to me that I had never taught it in my class was the importance of Confucianism in Vietnamese culture. This was something I had never emphasized. Confucianism, an ancient uh, Chinese uh, system of philosophy and ethics that emphasizes, here's what inspired Confucianism. Great civilization was built in China. The question became, the question that the emperor asked, how do we keep it? Many civilizations have come and gone. How do you build a civilization that endures? Confucianism was the answer. Confucianism, therefore, emphasizes 
stability, order, unity, you know, the collective endurance of a people. It's very deeply, profoundly un-American. We emphasize individualism, progress, change, mobility. That's not Confucianism at all. Confucianism is about keeping what you have and allowing it to endure. It's all about order. And once, you, once your eyes are opened to the importance of Confucianism in Vietnam, you do begin to see it everywhere. You begin to see it in the relationships between men and women, parents and children, you know, citizens and authority figures, and you also see it in the traffic. <laughs> Let me talk a little bit about the traffic. The traffic in Vietnam is something you get warned about before you go, and it is a worthy of a whole lecture in and of itself. Uh, the traffic is remarkable, number one, because it's not mainly automobile traffic. There aren't that many automobiles in, in Vietnam. It's mainly these motorbikes. And it's amazing what you can put on a motorbike. Here's a guy with, you notice chicken eggs in front, or maybe duck eggs front and back. Mm -hmm. These great big vases there surrounding him. These are actually dead chickens themselves. Um, here you have a, a, a pair from the country bringing their vegetables to market in, in Hanoi. Uh, and then up here are goldfish on the back of a motorbike. You can imagine the families shoved on one motorbike. Look at this, it's incredible. And there's every manner of, apparently, you know, if you're educated in it, there's like the Mercedes of motorbikes, and then there's the Chevy of motorbikes. And some people have high status helmets, some people have low status helmets. And so there's motorbikes everywhere. The second stunning thing about the traffic is there's just a lot of it. I mean, the, this is a country, this is one of the fastest growing economies in the world. The GDP has doubles every eight years. It's, the economic growth is something that we haven't experienced since the 19th century. Uh, and so people are out and about doing things. They're buying things, they're selling things, they're going from job to job. And the remarkable thing in the North this is all this traffic is done without any traffic rules. No stoplights, stop signs, or speed limits. The intersections are fascinating to behold. It is like a murmuration of birds or a, a school of fish, you know, going around things. Just stunning. And I have a short clip here that I thought I'd play for you in a loop. Uh, just to give you a sense of how unbelievable the traffic really is. This is an intersection in Hanoi. No stoplights. Look at that. People figure it out. Isn't that incredible? Now, you'll notice there are crosswalks there. <laughs> Crossing the street is a real adventure, and we'll learn about it. I know my daughter, when we realized we were going, my younger daughter came to me one night with uh, the laptop and said, Dad, I think you need to watch YouTube before we go to Vietnam, because there were all these YouTube videos about how to cross the street in Vietnam, and they were very specific and very right. Nobody will stop for you in Vietnam. You, they will go around you. They will not stop for you. So you're taught. And I, I, I think many of us decided when we saw the traffic, you know what, we'll stay on this side of the street the whole trip. Um, but my daughter really encouraged me to try and cross the street. She said, Dad, I'll hold your hand. And what you do is, and she did, and what you do is you step off the curb into the street and you start walking. You pick your gait. Has to be a steady gait. Because those motorbikes have to be able to predict where you're going to go. You can't freeze. You can't run. You have to do the same pace across the street. And as you're walking, motorbikes are zooming in front of you and behind you at the same time. And you feel that wind. And man, it is terrifying. But you make it to the other side of the street. And what is amazing is with all this traffic and all this chaos, you don't see any road rage. 
Yeah. Nobody giving each other the finger. Nobody, <laughs> no obscenities. Nobody even honking in anger. You don't even see a look of anger on anybody's face. It's really remarkable. And it's all because of Confucianism. Absolutely. One of the nine pillars of Confucianism is courtesy. Is you repress what you want, you repress your own desire for the good of the group. And everybody is courteous with one another. They give polite little honks. I'm right beside you. I'm coming around. And it works. It's stunning how it works. But it only works in the north. <laughs> because in the south, where, which is not as traditional, where Confucianism does not, did not take root, they're more like us. And you feel that immediately when you go to the south. You're like, oh, finally, these people are kind of like Americans, you know? Uh, and, but because they don't adhere to Confucianism, they do need traffic signs. They have stoplights, they have speed limits, they have directions, and cops will write you a ticket. Um, there are a lot of other things where you see Confucianism at play, especially in the north, the modesty in the dress. You don't, you tend not to see outlandish hairstyles or earrings or, you know, bare shoulders on women. People dress more conservatively and traditionally. In the South, anything goes. You know, very cosmopolitan. It's like, Saigon is like New York City. But in the North, it's very conservative, very patriarchal. We were there for International Women's Day, and my daughter, who's quite the feminist, uh, was stunned that at the hotel when we arrived on International Women's Day, they gave every lady a flower. I think it was a rose. And she said, they're treating it like Mother's Day. Don't they understand what this is? Um, the other thing which I had no idea about was the amount of alcohol that Vietnamese people drink. They drink beer, and they drink it all the time, every night. They are the biggest alcohol consumers in all of Asia. I had no idea, I, especially in the North. And I do think it has something to do with that repression, uh, having to do with this is their outlet. It's mainly men. And every town has its own beer. There's Saigon beer, there's Hanoi beer, there's Huda, which is Hui and Da Nang beer. I didn't care for that so much. And uh, there's this stuff, right, that you guys remember from Vietnam. What was it called? Bom 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 This That was horrible beer. <laughs> now, so I guess it was really horrible then, too. Um, and at one point, Con, our guide, as we were in, you know, you get served beer like with every meal. Like, it, you know, and I drank it. I'm not a big drinker, but you know, I had a beer at lunch. It was a little bit weird. And after a while, Con said, came up to us and said, I think it's very funny how you Americans drink beer. And we said, why? What's funny? And he said, well, you only have one or two. <laughs> and I said, well, how many do you have? He said, when you drink beer, yes, you have as many as you can possibly have. And then you walk home. And he said, when you walk home, you become Spider-Man. <laughs> and he said it in Vietnamese. That's what, getting very drunk, that's how they say it in Vietnamese. You become Spider-Man because you have to feel your way along the wall <laughs> to get home. Uh, Khan uh, also, there was, uh, Confucianism, one of the elements of Confucianism is respect for your elders, as you can imagine. A philosophy that emphasizes stability and unity and order, respect for elders runs really, really deep. It's extremely important to them. And so the Vietnamese people, you know, I was, and I was told this before I went, um, they need to know how old you are. If you're around a Vietnamese person for more than an hour, they're going to ask you, how old are you? And they know that Americans find it a weird question and a little bit rude, but they have to know. It's very important to them. And it took day two for Khan. Oh, and I also learned another part of North Vietnamese kind of tradition is they don't like to be touched very much. And we're always putting our arm around them. <laughs> it's clearly uncomfortable with that. Um, but uh, it, it was day two. Khan came up to me and said, Mr. Toad. <laughs> and his hands were like this. And he had a bad look on his face. He said, how old are you? And I said, I, this is exactly, I'm not exaggerating his response. I said, I am 52 years old. And he went, oh, I am so sorry. I am so sorry. I am so sorry. And I, I knew what he was 
what was up. He thought I was younger than I am. And I said, did you think I was younger than 52? He said, yes, I did. You, you look younger. And I said, oh, I haven't mentioned this. This is the other important thing. They need to know how old you are, not only because they revere elders, but because the Vietnamese language has no pronouns. Think about that. No he, no she, no you. So when Khan walks over at a restaurant and says, points to somebody and says, he needs another beer, he has no he. So what the Vietnamese people do is they give you a family name. And the Vietnamese language has 10 times the number of family names than we have. You know, we have mother, father, brother, sister, older brother, cousin, uncle. They have 10 times that number of very specific names. For example, they have a name for a word for your father's younger sister who is unmarried. <laughs> and that's what they call teachers. Oh, oh teachers. Yeah, teachers. Teachers. Um, so, I said, okay, Khan, what had you been calling me when you thought I was younger? He said, I had been calling you older brother. And I said, what do you call me now? What are you going to call me now? And he said, young uncle. <laughs> and I said, couldn't I be older brother? He said, no, no. absolutely not. No, that is such a, that's such a fall in respect and honor. You definitely want to be young uncle. It's the, I have no idea what they called you, Larry. What? <laughs> Wait, call? Hold for it. Oh. <laughs> a few words about the mystery and marvel of the Vietnamese language. Not only does it lack pronouns, it's also a monosyllabic language. That means every word, one syllable. Let that sink in. Every word is only one syllable. That means they have a lot of vowels, 12 of them. Here they are. Every vowel can be said in a different tone. There are six different tones for every vowel. So there are 72 vowel sounds. And that's before you get to the diphthongs. Remember those? <laughs> from junior high school, and trip thongs, where you put two vowels together, three vowels together. Somebody said, Vietnamese is like singing a language with sounds you never knew existed. And that's why when you hear somebody singing, uh, singing speaking in Vietnamese, is there's an up and down, dong, ming, dong, you know, up and down tone, and very clipped short words, because they're all one syllable. It is very difficult to speak, and it's very difficult for a Westerner to master. When I say I never quite learned how to say hello in Vietnam, I really mean it. Because if you get the tones wrong, man, you're saying something completely different. Here's an example. Here's the word ma, M-A. Same vowel, same word. Six different tones. Depending on the tone, it could mean, M-A could mean ghost, butt, cheek or mother, tomb or grave, horse, code, or rice seedling. There is a great story about this guy, Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara. You may remember him. Um, he was Secretary of Defense under John F. Kennedy and Lyndon Johnson. He visited Saigon in 1964, and he gave a speech to some officials. And he wanted to end his speech with a Kennedy-esque tag in Vietnamese, just like Kennedy did in Berlin, the 89 Berliner. He wanted to end the speech with something in Vietnamese. And what he wanted to say was, long live South Vietnam. Uh, but he got the tones wrong. And what he ended up saying was, the southern duck wants to lie down. <laughs> he never tried that again. Very easy mistake to make. As we traveled south of the DMZ, the 17th parallel, which separated North Vietnam to South Vietnam, that's when we got into a little bit more familiar terrain. The people there seemed more American. It was more cosmopolitan, more modern, more diverse. Uh, kind of friendlier towards Americans, but it was also very much the place where our veterans served because we fought the war in South Vietnam. So we began going to those places that were where we fought in, in Da Nang, up near the DMZ, down in the Mekong Delta, the Kuchi Tunnels, you know, uh, 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 north and, and west of Saigon. Uh, and we learned, and I, you know, we had known this, but to see it viscerally. There was one thing that we call the Vietnam War, but if you're on the ground in Vietnam, there were at least six different Vietnam Wars, depending on where you were. The war in the Mekong River Delta was very different from the war in the Central Highlands. And just generally, early on in the war, 
Most of the fighting was done early on in the southern part of South Vietnam, in, in three corps and parts of two corps. Uh, these were tactical zones that the American military gave uh, South Vietnam. And it was in the south that most of the time the enemy was the Viet Cong, what we call the Viet Cong, what they were called themselves the NLF, the National Liberation Front. These were mostly part-time fighters, guerrilla fighters. They were farmers by day, fighters by night. There were a few full-time guerrillas, uh, but mostly they were part-time. And most of the damage that they did to Americans were, were done by snipers, sniping, very quick ambushes, hit and run style, a lot of mines, you know, a lot of booby traps. It was not too uncommon early in the war to serve as an American GI in Vietnam, have many men in your company killed and wounded, and never really lay eyes on the enemy. You never really saw them. It was immensely frustrating. Uh, and these tended to be lightly armed and poorly trained. In 1967, the bulk of the fighting shifted north to I Corps. And it was here that the Americans faced a very different enemy. Not the Viet Cong, but the NVA, the North Vietnamese Army. This was the National Army of North Vietnam. These were not part-time guerrillas. These were full-time, well-trained soldiers. They had artillery, they had tanks, they even had airplanes. And beginning in 1967, for reasons we could talk about later, they began pouring over the DMZ from North Vietnam into South Vietnam and attacking these pretty isolated outposts of Marines. We had Marines in these isolated outposts along the DMZ. Why were they there? Probably as bait. Probably as bait put there by William Westmoreland as part of his war strategy. Uh, they wanted the NBA to come down, not in little platoons, or companies like they were doing with the Viet Cong in the South, but battalions and regiments and whole divisions were coming south beginning in 1967 and taking on Marines at these isolated outposts. The most famous of these battles took place at Quezon. We went there. Quezon, 3,000 feet up in the air, a remote location, uh, seven, miles, um, seven miles from the Laotian border, and 15 miles from the DMZ. It's a mile by mile and a half plateau in a valley. And in 1968, three NVA divisions came down across the DMZ and surrounded the 6,000 American Marines at Quezon. Surrounded them. They choked off resupply efforts. All resupplies had to be by air. And they began shooting at airplanes that started landing. Uh, they would launch mortars and rockets into the compound where the Marines were. And you could see that's why it was dug like World War I trenches. Because it's just nonstop, 24 hours a day. Ray Emilio's here, he'll tell you, he was there. It would rain, rain down these explosives. You were always kind of you know, hoping it wouldn't land on you. Uh, as they also then tried to penetrate the perimeter around Quezon. And Marines were put on these outposts to prevent them from penetrating. Meanwhile, life inside the compound at Quezon became pretty hellish. Uh, for a time, food and water were in short supply. Men would be wounded and couldn't be evacuated, and they would die there on the plateau. Uh, the enemy hit an ammo dump at Quezon. It was really nasty. This was a siege for 77 days. And I love on the back of his flak jacket, one Marine, somebody recently said, Marines have the best sense of humor of anybody in the world. He wrote, caution, being a Marine in Quezon may be hazardous to your health. <laughs> uh, the Marines pleaded with President Johnson, with General Westmoreland, to pull them out of there. Quezon had no strategic value left, if it had any to begin with. LBJ became obsessed with Quezon. He had this relief map that he would consult every day, pour over it, pour over the battle, watched it very closely, and determined that if we pulled out, it would be such an embarrassment to the US war effort it wouldn't be sustainable. He couldn't, so he didn't. He kept them in there. And then, very late March, very early April of 1968, those three divisions of NBA, 20,000 North Vietnamese soldiers, disappeared, leaving very few bodies behind. 
Why they left is something of a mystery. It's called the Riddle of Quezon. The Marines stayed there until July and then abandoned it in July. Both sides claimed victory. We visited Quezon, and what stunned me about it was how utterly beautiful it is. This is a subtropical rainforest up in the mountains. You're looking down into a valley. There are artifacts there. And there's a lot there that you could recognize from the war, but it's quiet, it's still, and it's beautiful, surrounded by coffee plantations, coffee farms, and some pepper trees. We had two Quezon Marines with us, <coughs> Ray and Ray. We called them Ray 1 and Ray 2. Ray 1 is in this room. Mm -hmm. And I, we caught this great photo of Ray and Ray looking at an aerial photograph in a little museum that they have there. And they found where their hooches were when they were at Quezon. And we were able to get this Ray right standing right exactly where his hooch was. And look how good looking Ray used to be. Before he, um, uh, just such a wonderful photo of, of then and now, 50 years ago. And in that same museum, I have to say, one of the favorite things I, I've seen in a museum anywhere is here's Some museums are, in Vietnam are very up-to-date and modern, and they tell the truth. Other museums are filled with propaganda. This is one of the older propagandized museums. And here it has a list of some inaccurate numbers. And my favorite thing is, <laughs> this is the, um, the tally that they took on the enemy, the toll that they took. They claim to have sunk 80 American ships at Quezon. There's no water at Quezon. Another striking thing about Quezon is people go there to have their wedding photos taken. And we encountered this couple right in front of this tank here, you know, getting wedding photos taken. And I thought I would just end the talk on, on two kind of poignant moments, inspirational moments, uh, that occurred during the trip with our vets. Uh, the one was this moment at the DMZ. Right at the 17th parallel, there's again a little tiny museum there. And we were stopping and looking around, wandering around. And one of our travelers was this guy on the left, uh, Andy Niggett, who's a Marine, uh, wounded very badly in 1968. We're actually going to be honoring him as one of our veteran voices of the year at our annual gala on Saturday. And uh, Andy Niggett was badly wounded by an enemy rocket in the face. He lost 80% of his jaw, 26 teeth, part of his tongue. It took him years and years and years, 10 years of reconstructive surgeries to kind of, you know, put his face back together. But you could see this guy was badly wounded. We're there at the, at the museum, and this Vietnamese guy is staring at Andy. And he comes over to Andy, and he goes like this, war? And Andy said, yeah, I got injured in the war. And the guy said, the Vietnamese guy said, me too. And he pulled up his pant leg and he had a mangled leg. And then he said, NVA. And Andy's, <laughs> Andy's kind of like, oh, hi, that's great. You know? <laughs> and then the Vietnamese man starts sobbing. And Andy just does the right thing and the beautiful thing and just embraces the guy. And it was amazing, these two old warriors who didn't hardly were able to communicate at all with each other just embracing each other across the gap of 50 years was just one of the most beautiful sights I've ever seen. The, uh, another uplifting event happened at the DMZ. You saw that picture I showed at the beginning of our seven veterans. And as we were lining up taking a picture or walking back from it, this young woman from Saigon walked up to us and said, uh, are you veterans? And they said, yeah. And she started a conversation and she said, thank you. I want to Shake your hands and thank you. And I think maybe you guys were a little taken aback that this is before we worked our way further south where I think you got some other thank yous. But they were taken aback that a young person would know this war at all and would be thanking American GIs. She said, thank you for what you tried to do here. You know, and you introduced a lot. You built up a lot of our country. You introduced concept of, of democracy. We're pursuing those concepts. And she said, I think Vietnam will be in a, a democracy in five to ten years. Wow. And we walked away, and I think Larry, who's in this picture, might be able to tell you, we walked away and Lou Moody, who's the other uh, Army veteran in this picture, said, maybe we're going to win this thing after all. <laughs> and I think the most gratifying for me for our trip to Vietnam was that I believe our veterans came back from that trip with a 
better sense of their service in Vietnam. I think it was affirming to their service. I think there was a sense that they actually had done something constructive and useful in Vietnam. And that, for me, was the best part of the trip. Thank you very much. I wanted to thank you, Todd, once again. Can we open it up to some yeah, questions? Yeah, yeah, let's do okay, it. Okay, terrific. Let's do it. I think we have some helpers in the back that are going to pass. Oh, thank down. you, yes. We have a woman right here who would like to ask a question. I want to know if well, you saw... Hold on for the mic. Did you see many traffic accidents with all that? Did you? Did we see many traffic accidents? Yeah. I, I think we saw one. Yeah. Maybe on a bridge. We saw one where there had been a crash. Um, <clears throat> apparently, I did a little digging to try and find out because I was very curious. You know, what's the accident rate? Turns out it's a state secret. <laughs> Which tells me there are a lot of accidents. And, uh, and, and, they, and they keep it hidden. Uh, so yeah, I think there are accidents. But I, I wonder where those accidents occur, in the south or in the north. Yes? Well, I was noticing the beer cans. Did you see a lot of signs written in English? Oh, well, uh, you were noticing the beer cans. Did we see a lot of signs written in English? What would you say, guys? Not that many. Not that many. I mean, there, you know, 15 years ago, there were no American travelers in Vietnam. Uh, in the past 10 years, there have been more and more. So I think there's an increase in the tourist trade. But it's still not too common to see a lot of Americans. There was one picture that we had. Can you use the mic so people can hear? There was one picture that we had of an intersection, and there was a KFC, and there was also, um, there were two or three other American businesses. So you see a lot of American businesses now, and a lot of uh, yes. other country uh, businesses, not just Vietnamese. So you do Good see... Point. You do see a lot of that kind of sign. Brand names, yeah. You yeah. see brand names, yeah. but not signs, I guess, in right. English. Yeah. Uh, I have two questions. One, did you see any American Jeeps painted blue or purple or green as taxi cabs? No, no. no. And the other question is, uh, I, I got to Vietnam in January of 66, and it was basically a French colony. <clears throat> And I didn't hear you mention anything about the French. Yeah, the French, of course, colonized Vietnam. It took them 30 years to subdue Vietnam between 1858 and, and 1886. And they ended up controlling Vietnam until 1954. And they influenced Vietnam heavily, especially they industrialized Vietnam. They introduced kind of a modern infrastructure. And they also introduced this language. Vietnamese used to be written in ideograms, ideographs, a Chinese kind of you know, written language. The uh, French introduced this Latin Vietnamese language that we see now. So now everybody reads the Latin language. There were French tourists there. And, uh, and I asked Khan and maybe somebody else, how do you feel about all these French people? Because the French ran a brutal colony. They were absolutely brutal. Brutal colonialists in Vietnam. And I said to Khan, how do you feel about all these French tourists coming? He said, oh, we love the French. They built our country. That is such a Vietnamese attitude. Like, we'll take what you give us, and then we want you to leave. In fact, can I tell one little story? This is not at all apropos to your question, but it so struck me. It was told at our breakfast recently. We have a uh, you know, veterans breakfast club. We had a, a Navy CB stand up and tell a story. He served in Vietnam near the DMZ. And you know, if you know about the CBs, they're the great builders of the Navy. They build rail strips. They build uh, you know, harbors and roads and ports. And um, their weapon is the bulldozer. He was at a base near the DMZ, near Dong Ha. And he said it was stunning. They were right near the enemy. And the enemy would shoot their artillery over our base and hit the Marines behind us. But they never hit us. Until one night, two in the morning, an artillery barrage. Brutal. Many CVs were killed, others wounded. The next night, this CV said, I'm listening to Hanoi Hanna on the radio. She was like the Axis Sally of the Vietnam War, you know, speaking in English and propaganda from Hanoi. And she said, I have a message for the Navy CVs at whatever base they were at. I would like to personally apologize for shelling your base last night. That was an accident. 
we will make sure that artillery officer is never in charge of another battery, artillery battery again. Because we want to thank you for building our country that we're going to enjoy when you leave. <laughs> that is so Vietnamese. Absolutely. Yes. The uh, quotation about understanding the people. Yeah. Where can I get that or say it again? Oh, that quotation uh, of, of Pham about, you know, we didn't understand the people we were fighting uh, is in, is in uh, David's book. And I don't think I have a picture of the book, do I? No. It's, in Dave, it's by David Lamb, L-A-M-B. And the book is called Vietnam Now. Vietnam Now. It's a wonderful book. Vietnam Now. Yes, wonderful book, well worth reading. Yes, George. How prosperous is Vietnam? How prosperous is Vietnam? I would say, and these guys, you know, who traveled with us, uh, I'd love to hear you chime in. I would say the cities are very prosperous. The countryside is very poor. There's a big urban-rural divide. I mean, you go up, we went up into the mountains to Quezon as you're traveling up that mountain. You're leaving, this is fascinating, you're leaving the world of the Vietnamese. Vietnam has 54 recognized ethnic groups. Some of them with just 500 members. They have their own language, they have their own dress, their own customs. And we went, you guys called the Montagnards when you were in Vietnam. Uh, the Montagnard villages are very poor. Rural people are still very poor. Uh, but in urban areas, especially in Saigon, you get the sense of an upwardly mobile white collar class. And they are selling and buying and working. They're always moving. Ray, did you have something to say about that? How many people live in Saigon, right? Ten million? Ten and a half million. Ten and a half million people. Yeah. One of the biggest cities in the in the world. Hmm? I said George probably got one of their shirts on. I saw a shirt on. Yeah. What's it made Vietnam? That's right. That's right. Yeah, jackets. Uh, you know, hats, clothing. They. Uh, it, it, China has done a lot of outsourcing to Vietnam, and that helped kick their uh, economy into gear. Once they joined the World Trade Organization. Uh, you know, they became a most favored nation trading partner with the U.S. way back in the 1990s, and um, their economy has just taken off, skyrocketed. And their use of technology, everybody has a cell phone. Yes. Everybody. I don't care how poor you are, you've got a cell phone. It's helping to move them along. Yes. Yeah, they're moving very rapidly along. Yeah, their technology is stunning. Why do you think that, that worked out whenever uh, the North Vietnam how do you think that worked out when the North of Vietnam came down and uh, the United States, the Americans, decided to leave Vietnam and let the whole country be subject to the North Vietnam? Wasn't the conservative nature of the North, wasn't it introduced down to the Saigon area in the South? What happened there? I guess it didn't stick. Yeah, it was a catastrophe. Uh, the, the North Vietnamese triumph the fall of Saigon was a catastrophe for the Vietnamese people. I mean, they immediately, their economy went into a tailspin. They start, launched a large war in Cambodia. Uh, they collectivized the agriculture, which was a catastrophe. People were starving to death in the 1980s in Vietnam. It was one of the, along with Haiti, one of the two poorest countries in the world. Uh, and, and Vietnamese people did not really emerge from famine until about the year 2000, which is stunning to think. Yes. The economic growth since the year 2000. I know, didn't Con, our guide, say something about, like, I never got enough to eat until the year yes. 2000. Yes. That was about the year I had enough rice to eat. Yes. And I think a lot of Vietnamese people would say that. Tell them about the suspicion of the North and the South with Con and that other country. Yeah, the, the Northerners and Southerners don't like each other very much, often. Uh, you know, they're one, one country with two very different visions for what the future should be. And we had a vet, Lou Nudi, who wanted to take a tour further into the Delta where he served. And he contacted a tour guide, a Vietnamese tour guide who's going to take him there. This Vietnamese tour guide was a member of ARVN, the Army of the Republic of Vietnam, our ally, the South Vietnamese Army. And uh, we wanted, you know, he didn't speak English that well. So we wanted Khan, our guide, who's from Hanoi, to talk with this ARVN tour guide and get the details about how they're going to get looped to the Delta. Well, Tony, the Arvin tour guide, kept hanging up the phone on Khan, and Khan said, I can't talk to the guy. He won't talk to me because of my northern accent. 
he hates me so much. And we had to talk him down. We had to say, we'd say, Khan's a good guy. He's one of us. And finally, Tony was agreed to talk to him. But yeah, there's great animosity between North and South. Todd, what, what, do, Todd, what do the people in the South think of Ho Chi Minh now? I mean, of course, he's deceased, but the Southern people, do, do they accept, would they accept him and his philosophy? You know, um, Ho Chi Minh, I do, I get the sense that Ho Chi Minh is universally respected in Vietnam as a leader. He had led the independence of the country from the French. Uh, and he was a moderating influence uh, in the Communist Party in the North. There were, he was against, for example, the Tet Offensive. He thought the Tet Offensive would be a disaster, but he was out of power by the time the Tet Offensive came, and he would die a year later. However, the South is not in love with Ho Chi Minh. In fact, there was just a battle in Saigon. They were going to take down a statue of a revered ancient emperor of Vietnam and replace it with a statue of Ho Chi Minh, and the people of Saigon protested, and the government backed down. So Ho Chi Minh may be great, but he's not at the level of one of those first emperors. Was it Saigon? One last question. Ho Chi Minh City. Uh, no, Ho Chi Minh was not from Saigon. Ho Chi Minh no, was I from. Meant, a, then they call Saigon. Oh, they call Saigon yeah. Ho Chi Minh yeah, City. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah. That, uh, but nobody like calls that. it that. Yeah. It's only a name on a map. Everybody in Saigon calls it Saigon. Everybody in Vietnam calls it Saigon. Okay. One more question. Do you have one in the back? Uh, just. Do you have any idea of what the uh, average age? Oh, great question. I should know that fact. What is the average age in, in Vietnam? I don't know, but I'm willing to guess. Is it that old? Oh, I think I would have guessed it's much younger than that. It seems like a young country with a lot of young people. Uh, I, what's the average? What's the median age in the United States? I would imagine mid-30s, maybe. Pittsburgh, probably. What, 75? 75. Uh, no offense. Uh, but in Vietnam, you do get a sense of a rising young generation. The vast majority of people in, living in Vietnam have no memory of the war. And they're not really that eager to talk about it, you know? It's history. Okay, well, thank you once again. I'll turn the lights on. We do have some snacks. I also want to mention that all of the books that are behind Todd, I don't know if David Lamb's book is there or not. But something that I did watch this weekend that really you put a real I watched whoops, uh, I watched yeah. Full Metal Jacket Got this weekend. I'd never seen that movie, but that the Tet Offensive yes. took that was happening during yes. this That's and right. the snipers that you talked about. I don't know if you had drill sergeants like the one that they had in the beginning, <laughs> but that was really scary too. So please join me in thanking Todd once again. Do you know Mr. Hosea?